Right. Hi, everyone. So I'm Jules Tilly, research scientist at RACO. And today, I'm going to talk to you about um, how you can compute molecular excited states on a, a rig QPU. OK? So I'll first talk uh, very briefly about what we do at RACO. Then I'll move on to tell you why you would want to ever compute molecular excited states, why it's relevant, relevant for, why well, QPUs are relevant for this. And then we'll go into the method a little bit more. So, RACO, we are a London-based startup which uh, leverage on expertise from quantum computation and machine learning to provide products and solutions to our customers. We have three main objects. The first one is quantum machine learning. So we develop algorithms which aim to be implemented on near-term quantum computers. We do quantum-inspired machine learning. So again, we use our expertise in deep learning and our expertise in uh, quantum information to adopt, to sort of create new, um, new methods that can help um, our clients today. And finally, we are building Hyrax, which is a Python-based uh, development toolkit for quantum developers. So why would you want to um, compute molecular excited states on a QPU? Right. The first thing I'm sure most of you knows, but molecules can interact with light, and as they interact with light, they can gain more energy. And with these energies, molecules have different properties which are very relevant across a number of industries. Uh, these industries include pharma, uh, material, chemical uh, fabrications, and so on. So there's a number of applications for this. So you can think of drug design, you can think of, um, for example, material designs as well, or for example, um, if you want to build a new material for an OLED TV, uh, or even blood tests. You can do better blood tests with better uh, understanding of the electronic structure of your molecules. So the issue, and I think that's been raised uh, before um, today, is that if you have very large systems, uh, computationally it becomes extremely difficult to get an accurate result for the specific energies of these molecules. Uh, what is convenient is on a quantum computer, you get uh, the possibility to model extremely large system on a compact number of qubits. And as a result of this, quantum computing over offers a lot of promises in molecular modeling and in particular uh, computing molecular excited states. So before I go into explaining our methods, I just want to point out that there's been a number of methods that have been proposed to uh, compute molecular excited state on QPUs, and they all have their advantages, so I strongly suggest that if you're interested in the field, you go have a look at them. Um, it's very good read. Um, the last one is our method. So it's been developed by us at RACO in partnership with um, one of our customer, which is uh, the chemical company Johnson Mate. And it is called the discriminative BQE. So it starts, uh, as the name indicates, with a VQE. Now, I know that we've covered this several times today, so I'm going to skip through it in the interest of time. I don't want to force it on you a fourth time. So just very briefly, you know how it works. We minimize uh, the expectation value of a Hamiltonian uh, with respect to a parameterized state. Uh, just to point out, we are using the hardware efficient ansatz. Obviously, you can use any ansatz you fancy. Um, but we used it because it's very generalizable and it works relatively well on the rigidity QPUs. Uh, what you get out of it, what you get out of the, let's stay here. Well. What you get out of the VQE is a quantum circuit, which is parameterized with a set of angles, which uh, allows you to reproduce a model for the ground state. Now this circuit, we're gonna use it later on to be able to compute higher molecular excitations. So the way we do it is by using a generative game. So some of you uh, may have experience in machine learning or know well what a QGAN is. You should already understand this. But for the others, I try to, I'll try to give a sort of an intuitive explanation. So imagine we have three quantum machines. All of these quantum machines can take a quantum state as input, modify the states, and uh, output a new quantum state. Okay? These are sort of loose anal analogies to quantum circuits, uh, but that will help you understand how this works. So the first machine is what we call the ground machine. It takes a neutral state as input and output the ground state, which we've computed during um, our VQE. It then fits it into the discriminator. Uh, the second machine is a generator. 
this does exactly the same thing with one difference is that at this moment we do not know what the generator produces. We don't know what the state is. Uh, during this process, we can also improve the generator. It is a parameterized circuit, so as we go through iteration or iteration of the game, the generator gets better and better at doing its job. We'll see what it is in a moment. The discriminator is a, probably the most interesting in all this, is another circuit which takes either of these state as input, but doesn't know which one. And it is tasked to identify which state is which. The better it is, the better it will be able to distinguish between gr the ground state and the state that has been generated. So let's assume that it identifies the ground state. If the discriminator is right, we can look at this afterwards. If the discriminator is right, yeah, uh, we do nothing. It's already doing its job well, there's nothing to be done. If it's wrong, however, that means that the discriminator can be improved. Okay, so we update it so that it gets better at identifying the ground state when the ground state is sent. If, however, it, it identifies a generated state, and it gets it right, again, there's no need to do anything. For those of you that know QGAN, for the others, don't listen to me, but that is different. You actually update the generator here. But f for our methods, we don't, we do nothing. However, if the discriminator identifies a generated state and gets it wrong, then we know two things. We know that the discriminator is not good enough, but the generator is not good enough either. So we need to update both of them. What happens is that if we repeat this over and over again, the generator gets better at producing a state that helps the discriminator to distinguish between both the ground state and the generator state. That means that the generator produces a state which is as far as possible from the ground state. In mathematical term, that means an orthogonal state. Now the issue is that if we just use this generative game, uh, we produce a random state because there's an infinity of orthogonal, orthogonal state. So we need to go a little bit further. And to do so, we add a constraint on the generator. We ask the generator, at the same time as it helps the discriminator to distinguish between the two states, we ask it to compute, to, minimize, to compute the energy of the Hamiltonian that we're looking at. So with the same thing as a VQE. If we do this, we also need to change the rules of the game. If the discriminator is right in identifying a generated state, we need to check if the generator is doing its job properly. And namely, that means, can it be optimized to achieve a lower energy. If yes, then we need to update the generator and continue the loop iteratively up until we find convergence. If no, we've converged, and what we found is a state which is both orthogonal to the ground state and minimize the energy, which basically means we found the first excited state. So this is just an analogy. We cannot implement this directly on a quantum computer, but what we can do is that we can define it in a mathematical term, which can then be implemented. So we can define two cost functions, one for the generator and one for the discriminator, which we can update iteratively up until convergence. So I'm gonna go through these terms briefly uh, because it's a bit uh, complicated, but let's go through it. The first one, you've already seen this many times today. This is exactly, this is our VQ objective. We used, again, we use the hardware efficient UNSAT, but you can use whatever you want, really. Uh, the next term in the generator cost function is the same in the discriminator cost function. It is the term which you use as a proxy of whether or not the discriminator identifies a generated state. So you can see the quantum circuit just right here. You see that we have an unselect qubit which gets untangled with the discriminator and we only measure this. When, the, when we get a zero out of this, that means that the discriminator has identified a generated state. When we get a one, that means that it has identified a ground state. So what we do is that we first produce the generated state through the generator, as you can see on the circuit here. And then we use that state that we push through into the discriminator, it gets untangled to the axilla qubit and then measured, and that way we know if the discriminator has identified one or the other of the states. Uh, in the same way, we can do exactly the same thing. Here, SO is the circuit that we get from our VQE to compute the ground state. We then pass it onto the discriminator and we can measure uh, what the decision of the discriminator out of this. Uh, you can see if you look at the cost function, like for example the discriminator, if the discriminator is perfect, it will always get zero here, always get one here, and so this goes to zero, this gets to one, and this is minimized. Okay, so the discriminator is then optimal. So what do we get, so uh, yeah, uh, just one thing, you can do that for any number of excited states. Once you've completed the first excited state, you just add a new quantum machine, uh, or a new quantum circuit, and you ask the discriminator to distinguish between the known state and the generated state, and the process is exactly the same you just increase linearly 
the number of terms that uh, you have to compute in the, in the discriminator cost function. So now to our results. So first of all, uh, the simulation. Yes. Uh, on the left, you have the Hyrax sample code. So that's the platform I was talking to you about at the beginning. Um, this is a sample of a code, and this is a result for H2. So that's using our TensorFlow backend. So you see on the y-axis is the energy of the molecule. On the x-axis is a bond distance between the two hydrogen atoms, and the dotted line represents the forced, first four excited states. Uh, these are the exact resolution. What we get is are the blue dots that you see everywhere here, and we pretty much can get any accuracy we want, uh, depending on the number of measurements we are, we are doing. Um, so for the implementation on the QPU, we picked the Aspen 4 3 qubit D lattice, and we did so mostly because we liked the fidelities we got on the untangling gates. It was convenient for us. In terms of circuit, for the VQE and the, genera and the generator, we had um, eight rotation gates and two untangling gates. And for the discriminator, we had 18 rotation gates and six untangling gates. So now the rotation gates are never a problem, really. They are, uh, the fidelities are very high, so no, no questions here. For the untangling gates, we need to have some sort of mitigation strategy. But we have, of course, here two concerns, the noise that we can get and the amount of time it takes to run the algorithm. So for the noise, what we do is we do uh, error mitigation. So very conveniently, in PyQuil, you have a function which helps you to symmetrize your errors. So you can do that directly. Your errors are symmetrized, and from there, you can do extrapolation to get better results on uh, the value you're estimating. One thing that is very convenient with our algorithm as well is that the discriminator actually doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be good enough to distinguish between the two states, which means that even though it has more entangling gates here, more, it's a more noisy circuit, we, st we still don't care too much about it, actually, because it will still be good enough to, uh, to push us into an orthogonal state. Uh, in terms of runtime, what we did is that we tried parallel parallelization as well. So Nathan talked about it this morning, so I don't want to go into too much detail, but we also found that uh, we get significant speed up, and the speed up increases as the number of measurements we do. Uh, the only thing is we also realized that we lost a little bit of accuracy by doing so, and so there really is, uh, it's very important to think about error mitigations technique that will work for parallelization. So we need to think, as a community, we need to think about how to implement these to make sure that these systems work because this will be very important for us to uh, make sure our algorithm runs fast enough. So in terms of our results for the QPU, so I'll first present without error mitigation and then I'll go into the error mitigation uh, results. So for the ground state, you see that each dot is a new iteration, so we just do one bond distance here. So each dot is a new iteration of the VQE. Now it's a ground state. And we can see that the results converge, but it doesn't quite converge to the right value yet. Uh, and if we look at the first excited state, we have exactly the same uh, pattern, okay? We have a good convergence, but and it's quite stable, but we do not quite get to the right value. Now, if we include the error mitigation I talked about earlier, it works a lot better. So now we have the ground state, that's the ground state of H2, we get some very good result here. And similarly, for the first excited state, we managed to compute it without too much issues. It gets very close to the, the right target value. Sorry, just to mention the dotted lines are the target values. And, uh, and that's it. So very clearly here, what we, well, what we can take out of this is, first of all, um, the method works on the rigid QPUs, which is great. And also, it calls for us to keep working hardware and software together to make sure that we develop the appropriate error mitigation techniques, because they're obviously very efficient and important. And that's it.